1889, a black Mariah arrived at this house to arrest Florence Maybrick. Young woman had not yet reached her 30th birthday and she was arrested for the murder of her husband, James Maybrick, and she was to stand trial on the charge of murder for her life. How did this all come about? In the year 1880, Florence Chandler, Chandler being her maiden name, boarded the liner the Baltic, sailing from America to land at Liverpool. She was accompanied by her aunt. They came from the deep south of America and were well placed financially. And they were taking this young woman, who was then 17, on a tour of Europe. On board the first class part of the ship was James Maybrick, aged 41, a bachelor, a cotton broker from Liverpool, a wealthy man. Within a period of a week, James Maybrick and Florence dined together, lunched together, and promenaded the decks. They'd fallen in love. I just speculate after the passage of years, she was only 17, and he was 41. I suspect she was seeking a father figure because her father had long since passed away. By the time they embarked at Liverpool, they'd made a commitment to marry. And a grand wedding soon took place at St. James Church in Piccadilly in London. And then they returned to America, where they lived for three years in America, two children were born. And because young children had arrived, they decided it would be prudent to return to Liverpool. His business, of course, was cotton broking, and Liverpool was a main area in those days for that industry. And so, arriving in Liverpool, they sought a good and substantial residence. And indeed, that was the residence that we see called Battle Priest House. Now, in this large house, in those days, in its pomp, was a housekeeper, a Mrs. Yap. People may think it's very suitably named Mrs. Yap. And indeed, servants, they lived in grand style. Now, James Maybrick was a hypochondriac and made frequent visits to pharmacies, obtaining tablets, potions, drugs, anything to try and put right imaginary illnesses. James Maybrick not only worried about his health, but he also purchased arsenic. And the reason why he purchased arsenic was he believed it was an aphrodisiac. And so we do know now that he was a regular user of arsenic. He also visited London, stayed in London clubs, and left Florence, young woman, 20 years younger than himself, on her own. Now he had a friend, we use the word in this case loosely, called Alfred Brearley. And Alfred Brearley was also a cotton broker and was a bachelor. And in the absence of her husband James, she became more and more fond of Brearley. And they became lovers. One day they decided to go to London for a weekend to stay together in a hotel. When she returned, for reasons which I cannot help, he realized that she'd been unfaithful with Brearley. And a dreadful scene took place where he beat her so badly that she went to the doctor. In those days, 
matrimonial difficulties of that kind seldom were reported to the police. Now the marriage was in serious difficulties. More absence from home than they had hitherto. He went to London, came into the city of Liverpool to meet his friends more frequently. And this particular public house, the post house, was one of his favorite haunts. Now, his health was deteriorating. Doctors were brought in, specialists brought in, but nobody could diagnose what was the cause of this rapid decline in health. It puzzled the medics. His brother came, brother Michael, came to see him and began to talk to Mrs. Yap, the lady who was the housekeeper I mentioned earlier. And Mrs. Yap told a strange story. She said she saw Florence soaking 24 flypapers. Now, flypapers, we will remember years ago, the flypapers used to hang from a light, sometimes a mantle, sometimes an electric light bulb, and they were covered with syrupy cover, bluish material. I always believed that when the fly hit the flypaper, it died. Wrong. Those flypapers were soaked in arsenic, and the fly died from arsenic poisoning. And what Florence was doing was soaking the flypapers to get out of it the arsenic. Now, her explanation for this was that she believed that arsenic was good for complexion. This was not a time when cosmetics were so plentiful and available to women. And indeed, there was a magazine article which advocated this. And so she gave a perfect explanation of why she wanted this arsenic. But having said that, the suspicions were there. On May the 11th, in 1889, James Maybrick died at his home in Battlecrease House in Egbert, Liverpool. The coroner decided to have a post-mortem, and the post-mortem showed that James Maybrick's body had a quantity of arsenic in it, and amazingly, quite amazingly, the coroner brought a verdict, which in those days they could do, nominating or naming Florence Maybrick as being the person responsible for the death of her husband. The police, of course, were informed of the verdict from the coroner's court. And Florence, within a short space of time, was arrested and charged for murder to stand trial for her life at St George's Hall in the city of Liverpool. When Florence Maybrick arrived on trial for her life, a crowd had gathered outside this hall. There was a hiss of disapproval of her. She was escorted in, appeared in the dock in front of Mr. Justice Stevens. Now, Mr. Justice Stevens was an old man with waning powers. In those days, judges didn't have to retire at a certain age, and he was gradually failing in his ability to conduct a trial. 
Florence was defended by Sir Charles Russell, QC, eminent counsel, man of enormous reputation and ability. And he did his best for her. Got to remember that before 1898, in the Criminal Evidence Act, a defendant couldn't give evidence on their own behalf, therefore stand in the witness box and be asked questions by both the prosecution and the defense. So all she could do was make a statement from the dock. The question of her adultery seemed to be the issue at the trial. The fact that she had been adulterous with Brearley was a major factor that seemed to dominate the mind of the judge. Got to remember that the jury of 12 people would be of the so same social background as Maybrick himself. And despite all the efforts of Russell, the jury retired for a very short space of time and brought back a verdict of guilty. Judge donned the black cap and sentenced Florence to death. Now strangely, the crowd that had assembled on this plateau, who had hissed when she came to stand trial for her life, change of opinion. A sympathy had grown for her, an empathy a compassion and there's murmurs of understanding murmurs of disapproval of the verdict of the jury she was taken away from this building down to Aylesbury woman's prison in Aylesbury put in the condemned cell and there she waited for the day of her execution We must remember that it was 1907 when the Court of Appeal was founded for the hearing appeals on criminal matters. So she had no cause of appeal at all, no ability to do anything for herself other than accept the day of the dreadful sentence to be carried out. But Sir Charles Russell, believing totally in her innocence, pressed at the highest possible quarters, the American Embassy, the Home Office, at the palace itself. 48 hours before the day of her execution, when she'd heard building in the yard, the scaffold, she was informed that she'd been reprieved and the sentence would now be of life imprisonment. And she spent the next 15 years in prison. Charles Russell, now Lord Russell, never gave up fighting for her. He pressed and pressed and pressed that some mercy should be shown. But Queen Victoria was on the throne. And Queen Victoria and adultery weren't best friends. She hated adultery, and while she lived, she was determined to make sure that her home secretary would not detail the sentence. In 1901, Edward VII became king. He was a, the last person to condemn adultery. And within a couple of years, the Home Office, Home Secretary, announced she could be released and she returned to her native America and died in the 1940s, the late 70s years of age, 76 years of age, a recluse. Was she guilty? I don't know. But Sir Charles Russell believed passionately in her innocence and I will take his judgment. Now the victim, the person whose life was lost, was James Maybrick. 
And we often forget the victim in murder trials. But his name still remained a bit of a mystery of what kind of man he really was. And in the last 10 years, there's been discovered a diary or a journal which he's purported to have written in which he admits to be the Whitechapel murderer, Jack the Ripper, as he's become known, of those unfortunate ladies in Whitechapel. We will discuss this at a later date.